So good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second day of Sharkfest and the first, well, actual class session this morning. Um, so my name is Simon, Simon Lindermann. Um, I'm from Germany and I'm working for a company called Miele. I guess somebody knows those household appliances, maybe have some at home already. So uh, vacuums, washing machines, all that kind of stuff. Uh, mainly manufactured uh, in Europe, but uh, there's also more plants coming up around the world. So my job basically is in the world of a network engineer or network architect, however you want to call it, uh, taking care about our yeah, networks and the, uh, the WANs and LANs all over the world. Um, in part time, I also do some kind of freelancing uh, when it comes to network stuff, uh, consulting uh, or trace analysis. Um, I do that just for, for the fun when time allows on the other side. Um, all right. So, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, we were given these very fancy shark pointers um, in the beginning of the conference. Uh, so, I think we intended to use these to point to our slides, which I found a little bit, you know, could be, could be a challenge in this height. And I also, I also like to use my, my laser pointer. Uh, to skip through slides, so the obvious thing that, that had to come up is how are we going to fix this? Well, I ran this through the engineer's flowchart, um, <laughs> and the one thing that came out was this uh, freaking laser shark pointer, so uh, I'm going to be pointing and pointing at the same time. I hope that works for all of you. <laughs> okay, so the talk is as you might have noticed, mainly concerned TCP. Um, I've been giving a talk last year in US and also Europe about uh, TCP in general and how it evolved and revolved. Um, so this is actually a slide from that talk, uh, and I don't want to go into much detail here on this, but basically all of these things uh, I've been covering in the talk last year. So if you want to know about you know, how TCP evolved over time, which kind of congestion control algorithms we had, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you might want to look up this, but my idea was to, uh, you know, continue this track of TCP and how it evolves and what we can expect from it in the future. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm not going to cover anything of this except from uh, the partial act, uh, because I've done that last year already. Uh, but just to get warmed up, we're going to talk quickly about selective acknowledgement and uh, partial X. Gonna jump into a demo trace, um, figure out what's going on in this particular problem, uh, and then I'm going to continue and speak about some more fancy or new stuff that you might or might not have uh, seen yet. Again, this is uh, covered in last year's talk. So let's look at how we can deal with packet loss or how can we deal with uh, retransmissions. So back in the very old days, like we had when we had this scenario, like a bunch of packets going back and forth, and we, we do have a little bit of packet loss. So in this particular case, the packet number one and the packet number three has been lost, never reached the receiver. Um, and we go down in time, so this is the y-axis is the time, actually, and we will see if acknowledges for basically only packet number zero, because that's the only packet the receiver got, and it can acknowledge any of these others, because it's back in the old days, right? So there are mechanisms to do that uh, as of today, but still not back in the old days. So uh, what will be happening here is that after three duplicate acknowledgements, I guess everybody has heard about duplicate acknowledgements, um, latest in Chris' uh, class, if you have taken it in the beginning. Uh, actually, our sender will resend the packet number one uh, as a so-called fast retransmit. Why fast? Why not sending it on the first, on the first uh, acknowledgement? Well, um, we do need to take account that there's some latency on the path, right? So, um, and uh, we also need to be efficient. So what the receiver is doing, why we are still transferring packets, is letting us know, okay, I got, I got just the first packet, everything that follows uh, is basically unacknowledged yet. So after four in total, but three duplicate X, our sender will resend uh, the packet number one, and that actually makes the uh, receiver in this case start or continue acknowledging, but only for packet number two, because that's the next one he received, uh, and all the others were not yet acknowledged here at this point. 
So what will happen then, and we continue on the right-hand side, after time goes by, we most likely... Oh, wait. I'm going to hit a timeout, and that is probably the worst case that you can have, because that really slows you down. And only after a timeout, our sender will resend the packet number three, and then we will acknowledge packet number three, and four, and five, and so on. So there are two problems in here that we see right now. The first problem is um, that we, we see here on the right-hand side, we have to resend all of our packets that we have sent before. So that's very inefficient, right? Um, why don't we just you know, resend the packet number one and packet number three? Because those were the two packets that have been lost. Uh, and the other thing is, we are waiting for a timeout to appear because we don't have any more data to send at this point in time. All our data has been sent to the receiver. Um, so there, there's no, no traffic going back and forth, nothing that can be acknowledged. So we need to wait for a timeout to appear, uh, which makes the, the sender actually react and say, okay, something has going on here, has been going on. Uh, the receiver doesn't acknowledge my, all my packages. I need to resend all of it. So these are two major problems that we had back in the days um, that was even before TCP Reno. And um, the uh, one thing that we can take care about is covered in uh, TCP New Reno called Partial Egg. Um, so with Partial Egg, we have the same situation basically, but there's a major difference uh, after the uh, duplicate acknowledgements came in. And that means at this point in time, I'm going to resend packet number one because that's you know, still the one where, where my acknowledgers are. Uh, and the next thing that happens is that the receiver, again, resends an acknowledge or sends an acknowledgement for packet number two. But at this point in time, my sender knows, okay, I'm not going to wait for, let's say, more duplicate acknowledgements. What I'm going to do is I will immediately resend packet number three. So that is the thing that partial act covers uh, in this particular case. So again, compared to the slide before, we had to wait for a timeout or even more acknowledgements to come in. But in this case, after the first dupe X have been received, uh, the sender will resend the packet number three immediately without waiting for any, any more. So that's the thing called partial egg, and that's covered in uh, TCP uh, new Reno, which is still out there quite a lot. Um, yeah. Does the sender know that packet three was lost at this time? I don't think so. So it, it just sends it even if it wasn't lost? Um, it does not because it's only receiving the acknowledgement on packet number two but it has sent three, four, and five, so that's why he's resending two immediately, yeah. And I also noticed, like, when you tape down your um, little laser thingy here to your shark stick, you have no chance to get to the USB stick that you have to put in your laptop in order to make it work. So, yeah, funny. <laughs> There you go. The egg one should come before egg two. No, because egg two was received. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, does it work now? Oh yeah, very bad. Very good. Okay, so fast retransmit is happening on the next partial egg that the uh, sender receives. Uh, so that is cool, but we still haven't really uh, figured out how we can, uh, you know, high or increase the effectiveness on our um, retransmissions, uh, because we still need to resend all of our retransmissions, uh, all of our data after, let's say, uh, after this packet. So we still need to resend four and five because it's not yet acknowledged, right? So the mechanism that, take, that takes, care, takes care about that is uh, called TCP selective acknowledgement, and I guess Chris has covered this in his class, and I think also Sake has been talking about it in uh, his uh, case studies after, after the class. So here's what's, what's pointed out, oh sorry, here's what's pointed out in the RFC. TCP may experience poor performance when multiple packets are lost from one window of data. So that's what we have seen, right? So we had two packets lost in our five packets uh, of data that we have sent. And the receiving TCP sends back SAC packets to the sender, informing the sender has a data that has been received. Uh, the sender can then retransmit only the missing data segments. Okay, that's exactly what we are looking for, right? So we don't want to send all of it or resend all of it. We just want to send um, 
the missing data. And this is how it looks like. And I put this in the other format because otherwise I would run out of space very fast. So what we're going to do, we are going to transmit, and this is not uh, packets anymore. Uh, you have to look closely, so this is data now. So we are sending 10 bytes of data with every packet, just to keep it very easy. Um, and we're going to get acknowledgments for that, right? So it's perfectly fine. So our uh, receiver is receiving a packet, is acknowledging it, and then all of a sudden we hit packet loss again. That means uh, with the net, next packet that we are going to send, uh, which in total will be now 10, 20, 30, 40 bytes, we will only receive an acknowledgement for packet or data uh, number 20, because that's the, the last thing that the receiver has received, right? But something else will happen here, and this is uh, the selective acknowledgement option that you will see in, in uh, TCP uh, options in the header. Uh, we will have a new feature here, or new options, and those are called left edge and right edge. So what the receiver is doing here is saying, okay, I received everything up to data number 20, byte number 20, but in addition to that, I've also got something uh, in data number 40, because that's the, the last thing I've been sending here. And this continues. Uh, again, we need to have three duplicate X in order to you know, make something happen. Uh, and with this, you can see that uh, two values stay the same. That's the acknowledgement number, and that's the left edge. But the right edge will increase. And, and basically, the receiver is saying, okay, I've, I've got everything up to byte number 20, and in addition to that, I've also got uh, everything from 40 to 70, right? So after the three, third duplicate acknowledgement, we will retransmit the data uh, from the original packet number three here. And with that, the whole thing resolves, and the receiver will send me an, just a normal acknowledgement, acknowledging everything up to here. So you can see that from acknowledgement number 20, it will jump up to number 80, because that's all the data he has received, like with all my you know, 10 bytes of data I've been sending uh, to him. So this can be tricky if you just you know, scroll through uh, TCP trace, which we're going to do in a minute, and you spot like these big jumps of acknowledgement numbers, and you are not aware of this, so then you might be thinking, huh, what's, what's going on here? So uh, to prove that this is actually happening, um, I've got a demo trace for you, and everybody who has been downloading um, it before, or maybe not before, there's the link over here on the uh, whiteboard. Um, if you still want to do it. And there's a capture in it called sec and dsec.pcap. If you might want to open this with me, uh, you can follow along. So let's see. Sorry for that. Okay. All right, has everybody got that trace? Somebody still missing it? Um, how is it readable from the back, is that okay? Or should I increase the font? Yes, no, okay. A little bit up? Okay, let's see. Is that better? All right. So, oh my god, IPv6. Well, I do not really care about it at this point in time. The only thing I do care about it, it takes a lot of space from my uh, screen on my 15-inch monitor here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shrink a little bit. Uh, sorry, Jeff, in case you are here. Um, but I'm not really interested in, uh, interested in IP addresses. The only thing, I mean, we can quickly uh, prove that this is just a very basic trace, right? So we have one conversation in this trace. There's just a single, uh, single conversation between these two IP addresses. Um, we have two IPv6 addresses, uh, and that's basically it. So it's, very, it's a very easy trace, just one conversation. And that's exactly what I need out here. So let's look at it from the beginning. Um, let's see if we can fit all of it. So what we have is a perfectly three-way handshake of TCP. Uh, what we can see here, or spot here immediately, is that there's an option that says sec permitted. Uh, and this is in the SYN, as well as in the SYN ACK. So that means that the client, and also the receiver, or the server, is able of you know, speaking selective acknowledgement. So that's good. Uh, in the act, we don't have that option anymore, so both, both uh, receiver and the sender agreed on using it. 
So what you will see is the, the next thing that happens is a HTTP GET. So we're looking at HTTP here, obviously. And if we uh, open up our uh, byte window here, we can see that, OK, it seems to be a connection to uh, Facebook.com, uh, more precise on the v6 address of Facebook.com. All right, so far so good. So the next thing that happens is what? What does Wireshark tell us here in this case? Sorry? Yes, it's not captured. So what does it mean for us? Is that something we have to be concerned about? Mm -hmm. Could be packet loss. Or uh, in the other case, maybe just what you know, Wireshark tells us, it has not been captured, so it could be a bad uh, trace that we are looking at here. But you know, let's, not, let's not waste any time on this uh, at the moment. What we are going to look at is the, the next couple of um, packets here. So let's see. Uh, I mean, we are getting a little bit of data back from the server. So the, the long address here uh, is the client, and the short address is the server, just to, uh, that you can reference it in the trace. And we are getting some sort of data. Let's open up the TCP header here. And I will actually do one thing, and that is becomes very handy when you're looking at uh, TCP problems or, or like packet loss, potentially. Uh, we will do uh, apply these uh, three things here as a column. So the sequence number, the next expected sequence number, and also the acknowledgement number. The way to do this, and luckily, uh, thanks to Sake, we all know this by by now, there's a shortcut for it, so you don't really have to go right click and apply as a column, but what you can do is hit Control Shift and I for the Windows users, and this will make it appear as a column, uh, obviously at the very end, as always in Wireshark, and uh, it's very large as well, so let me bring this to the front for you. Um, sequence number, yeah, maybe not in front of the IP. About here, same thing for the next expected sequence number, and the same thing for the acknowledgement number, because that will help us to go through the case. And if you don't or didn't have done that yet, uh, please do so as well in your profile. Uh, it will help you a lot. So let's bring these two columns to the front as well. And the third one, it keeps increasing it. That's interesting. All right, so um, let me just quickly rename these because they will take up very much space here. And then we have added column, the next expected sequence number, and the acknowledgement number. All right, there you go. So resize once again. Uh, that's better. OK. so. Once again, uh, we have our client requesting some data from Facebook.com, and the next thing that happens, our server is sending back 20 bytes of data. Not too bad. But what can you see here immediately, like when you, when you look especially at the sequence number column? And I've turned on relative sequence numbers, right? So we're starting from zero and then, you know, making our way up. So this is the second packet that I received from, uh, from the server. And the first packet that I received had a sequence number of zero because there was a Synac. The next packet I received from him has a sequence number of 1461. So does that prove our theory of do we actually see packet loss? Yeah, right. So there must be something in between that I didn't get. It's not in the capture. Maybe it didn't make it to the client even. So the next packet here, packet number six in this case. Uh, let's see. We are acknowledging data. Um, but the acknowledgement is not very close to what we have, that we have been you know, receiving from the server. It's just one. Okay, fair enough. Maybe it's coming later. And then you see at this point in time retransmissions, TCP retransmissions from the server. Right. And the sequence number is actually, what, lower than the one we have received before? How is that possible? Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the options. I mean, this is a talk about selective acknowledgement, so we see there is actually selective acknowledgement in use. Let's look at that acknowledgement number in uh, packet number six again. So we see, and I will just leave this here in the, in the, you know, I will not go into the header in detail because you can see it right here. You don't need to go too deep into the header. So we are acknowledging 
byte number one, so that's the, the ghost byte, if you want to call it, because um, we are, have turned on relative sequence number. Zero is the one we started with, so we're acknowledging one. And the, the left edge is 1441, and the right edge is 1461. So that basically means, okay, I've received basically nothing from you, but then there's a gap, and then I've received 1441 to 1461. Okay, fair enough. So uh, we see a retransmission from the server, sequence number 1381, and it's sending uh, 1380 bytes of data. And our acknowledgement number from the client is going to in increase. So he's now acknowledging this packet, but he's still saying, well, uh, yeah, I've, I've got this packet, but I've also got 1441 to 1461. But there's still a gap in between, as you can see. So we have another retransmission from the server, and as you can see here right now, it's 1441. So that is exactly our left edge. And he's sending 60 bytes of data. Uh, and that makes our client go like, okay, acknowledgement for 1461, I've received everything I can right now. So the you know, selective acknowledgement option is completely stripped from, from the acknowledgement, the, the next acknowledgement the client is going to send. So at this point in time, at packet number 10, the whole situation resolved, like magically. All is good at this point in time. Um, our acknowledgement number jumped from 1381 to 1461. That covers our right edge, so we are good. Yeah? Does that make sense? So if you scroll down the trace, there's something else happening. I mean, this was just perfectly selective acknowledgement, as we have seen it on the, on the board a minute ago. But if you scroll down the trace, um, there's something else happening here. So what's going on here? And I will scroll a little bit to the left so you see both IP addresses. So again, the, uh, the short address, the, uh, which ends on three, is our server, and the long address is the client. So what's happening here? Wireshark is telling us out of order. Why? Why is that? Can you spot or can you immediately spot what's going wrong here? And I might highlight again that I added these three columns for that purpose. So if you follow along, the sender is sending data and the sequence number is increasing, obviously, because it's sending more data. That's what's happening, right? So we have 2841, 2901, 4281, so it was a big chunk of data, 4341, and then what? It's basically jumping back in time because it's now using a sequence number that has already been transferred. So within the same TCP session, we are seeing lower sequence numbers being sent from the server than in the whole conversation before. And that is the reason for why Shark is telling us, okay, so th there's something going on here. This is out of order because this is supposed to be way higher in the conversation as we see it, right? So how does our client react on that? Let's look at the next acknowledgement. And I'm going to scroll to the right again because that makes it easier. So our acknowledgement number is 4341. And that's basically acknowledging everything up to here, right? But we also say, okay, we have, a, we have a left edge of one and a right edge of 3081. So how does that work uh, in relation to the theory that we learned about selective acknowledgement? We have an acknowledgement number that is actually higher than the left and the right edge of our selective acknowledgements. So what is the client doing here? Why is, why is he doing that? And you can see if you, if you scroll down that this you know, number increases. The acknowledgement is always 43, 41, 43, 41, 43, 41. But the left and the right edge, those are just, right? And the mechanism we are looking here right now is called duplicate selective acknowledgement, or DSEC in short. Um, the client is doing that, and this is a perfect trace actually to illustrate it because you have both uh, scenarios in one trace. Um, the client is uh, you know, letting the server know that you're sending too much data to me. I've already received this. Please don't send it to me anymore. Right? So it's actually trying to 
increase the effectiveness of the TCP conversation. Um, and this goes on, goes on, goes on, goes on until finally, uh, and this is our right, you know, our right edge is right at 4341. The server is, uh, you know, sending data that perfectly fits into it. So it's sending a 5721 sequence number, adding 1380 byte of data that goes, you know, if you sum that up, that will be 4341. So that's exactly our right edge. And as soon as he do has done that, our acknowledgement looks perfectly fine again. But as you can see here right now, the acknowledgement number jumped from 4341 to 7101. So that's these jumps that I was referring to earlier. Yes, please. Uh, how you determine how the client lets the server know that he has already resent, uh, received the data? Is that a question? Well, yeah, you had said that the client was basically saying, I've already received the data. Yes. That's what the selective knowledge is doing, correct? Yes. Yes. Well, the selective acknowledgement says, I've received everything up to my acknowledgement number, plus, in addition, you know, the, the one that I have in my light from left and right edge. That's what selective acknowledgement does. But in that theory, if that it would be true, and we look at these selective acknowledgement in this case, it's saying, well, I received everything up to 4341, but I also received 20, 2901 up to 4281, but that's inside of this range, right? So the acknowledgement number is higher than the left and the right edge, so that doesn't make any sense if you just think about selective acknowledgements, right? Uh, well, and then, you know, the session is going to be turned down pretty, pretty easily or pretty fast here, uh, and that's it. So I don't really want to talk about the reason for that uh, and what actually caused this problem, but uh, if you have followed along, you might actually have a good, good clue about what was going on here, because, uh, and I give you a hint, look at the packet sizes. What, what maximum packet sizes do we see here in this trace? If I scroll down, and this is the TCP length here. It's not the packet size, it's the TCP length, basically. So what is the highest number you see? 1380, right? So let's go back to the very front, uh, very beginning of the, the capture. So we, we noticed, okay, Wireshark tells us we have not seen some sort of data that has been sent before. Um, so we are at least missing one packet, right? At least. Um, but if you look at the sequence number that the server uses in this case, does that ring any bell? Like is that a hint on what was going on before. And again, we jumped from sequence number zero to 1461. What is the uh, maximum segment size in almost all of your networks in, in the default? 1460. So what do you think, how many, how many packets are we missing here in this trace? And ju just one packet, right? So that exactly matches our default MSS. And I mean, if you look at what they have been agreeing on, the MSS is 1440, 1440 for both sides. Uh, but we are missing a packet that would perfectly fit in this 1460 window, right? So this is actually a problem of, of an MTU, uh, actually an MTU problem here, because uh, the first packet was not captured because it didn't make it through the network. It was just too big. That's, that's the reason for it. Okay, any more questions on SEC or DSEC at this point in time? Yes, the, the hint is actually here in the, in the sequence numbers because we started from zero and the next sequence number we receive from the server here, the, the, the three is the server, is 1461. So that means the packet before must have ended with 1460. Uh, and as you know, the bytes that we are going to send, the TCP length correlates to the sequence number, and that's the hint on, on the packet uh, size. One more question I have is, if I have the left edge and right edge, I alternate with sequence. I have one range and I have another range that I receive. In between, I miss it. So yeah. Uh, it is possible to, to show multiple ranges. So in this particular case, we only have one range here. Um, there's no, I think, no duplicate block somewhere. Uh, but in theory, when you open up the TCP header here, you can see that there is uh, theoretically more space for more, for more ranges, right? Uh, so does anybody know how much ranges you can actually have in the TCP header? One? 
Three? Or four? So Jasper would say it depends. Uh, on what? <laughs> yeah, the options basically. So you can have up to four blocks or ranges of TCP sec. Uh, depends on whether or not you're using TCP timestamps and stuff like that. So the more and more option you put into the header, and you know the header link is limited, uh, the less uh, selective acknowledgement ranges you can put in there. Okay, there was another question, or that's why. So in the three hands, we agreed on 14.4. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I cannot answer that, to be honest. Um, so uh, I don't really know the outcome of this trace. Uh, this was uh, sent to me by Chris uh, Lundström, luckily. So that was a good, uh, good trace for this particular case. But uh, I cannot tell you why, why it was sending 1460. Yeah, there could be a TCP proxy of some sort in between that didn't recognize the MSS, stuff like that. Yeah. Or just the value in the middle. Mm-hmm. Exactly. All right. That should be it on uh, selective acknowledgments. So let's jump back to the to the presentation. <clears throat> okay. So you might think, "Oh, that that was that was very funny," uh, but we all know this stuff. So. Pretty old, yeah. So let's tell us something new. And uh, I have been thinking about, you know, what can I actually do for this particular talk? Because I wanted to keep this track going on, TCP evolving, revolving. Um, talking about congestion control is one thing, and Vladimir has a, you know, perfect talk on that. So if you if you want to know how the congestion control window works and everything, I think there will be a second slot from Vladimir uh, later today or tomorrow. Um, where he will cover this, uh, his talk again. So uh, he has spent massive amount of time on, on analyzing that. So I thought, okay, uh, congestion control is one thing, but what about uh, other protocols? So I mean, we are talking about TCP the whole time, uh, and we are not really looking to the left or the right, what's going on there. So I came up with the idea, let's talk about a protocol called multipass TCP. Still TCP, as the name says it, but Mm, on multiple passes. Uh, has anybody yet heard about it or played around with it or even has it in production? Mr. Bidwell, okay. Somebody else? No? Okay, just one. That's, that's good. So you will learn something new hopefully today. So why multipass TCP? The motivation is pretty, pretty easy actually. Um, I mean, we have so many, so many networks that are becoming redundant. Uh, just because of the sake of redundancy, or maybe throughput, or both. Um, and you have so many paths in your network that are currently pretty much unused, because they are maybe just backup links, or um, you know, the load distribution doesn't work as you would expect. Uh, so in that particular case, you might want to you know, have a protocol that, that is fair to other protocols, but still tries to gain a little bit more advantage of all the redundant links that you have in your network. And the other thing is that, you know, all our mobile phones or tablets or whatsoever equipped with a Wi-Fi and a, and a cellular modem are basically in two networks almost all the time. So when you're here on the campus, you have the Wi-Fi and your cellular modem. So why not using both? I mean, uh, especially for applications that could actually use it like voice or stuff. Uh, when you roam around and move between networks. And then you obviously have, you know, in the web, there will be multi-home servers, um, maybe even in different, you know, BGP AS numbers and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that could be very useful. So, if you look at the, uh, the slide picture I had there in the slide before and, and increase a little bit, this is what usually happens. Like, you have server A and B talking to each other, they will open up most likely a single TCP connection, and this will, you know, utilize maybe this, this, these links, but all the other links are basically sitting there doing nothing, well, except for all the other traffic that's going on in your network, obviously. So what happens when I add the second TCP flow? Well, based on your, you know, load balancing mechanism, could be based on MAC addresses, on IP addresses, or maybe even on a layer four information, so taking source and destination port into account, it will load balance the traffic across your network, but there is cases where it doesn't really, you know, load balance 50-50, or if you have more links, uh, spread the traffic equally on all of those, of those links, and what you will end up with um, is bottlenecks at your, you know, very critical links in the network. Obviously, you want to size those big enough so that this is not going to happen, but 
Sure enough, at some point you will hit a bottleneck when you know, too many TCP connections use the same path in your network. So the statements, or the basics of TCP say, it uses a single link and a single path across your network, if not any other load balancing mechanism does something else with it. And it's always tied to a single source and a single destination IP. So when you open up a connection from your client, it will use your local IP address, it will use the server IP address, and that is your you know, two addresses you will see in the whole connection. That's it, nothing else. And you might see different source and destination ports, but it's just you know, these two IP addresses. If any of these things change, the connection breaks. So you will never get back to that voice stream uh, from Skype or whatever uh, if the connection breaks uh, at some point. So the team around, you know, the, the guys who were working on multipass TCP in the IETF came along with a couple of goals and uh, definitions for multipass TCP. And the three most important I've got here on this slide. So what you need, if you, if you introduce a new protocol in the network, you want to make sure that you don't break anything, but you will, you know, add extra goodies for people who are using it. So the one thing that you need to make, make sure is that it needs to work on today's networks, no question about it. It should also work whenever TCP works. Okay, so that sounds reasonable. And on top of that, it should support unmodified applications. So whatever applications you're running in your network and your software developers have developed, it should just use multipass TCP as a regular TCP connection uh, and maybe gain some benefits out of it without the programmer actually having to uh, reprogram the whole application. Yeah, sure thing. You might think uh, easy as easy easy as that. Uh, let's just you know go and develop a new protocol. That's a five-month thing, and then we will deploy it into production, or maybe not. So let's look at a very simple TCP, multipass TCP session setup here in this uh, particular case. So we have one client uh, with two interfaces, and we have a server with a single interface. Uh, it could be both. Uh, it could be two interfaces on both sides, it doesn't really matter just for this uh, particular example. So what Multipass TCP is doing, it's adding some options uh, in the regular TCP header uh, and letting the, you know, the client lets the server know, okay, you know, I'm Multipass capable and by the way, this is me. So this is just a token or a key, however you want to call it, that it has been sent with the initial SIN to the server. So the server in this case replies, okay, with the SYNAC, I'm also multipass capable. Uh, by the way, this is my token. Uh, in the final ACK, you will have the multipass TCP capable option again. Um, so compared to, for example, selective acknowledgement, where you only saw it, or MSS, or any other option, where you only see it in the SYN and the SYNAC, in this case, you actually have the options in all three packets of the three-way handshake. And I will tell you about the reason for that in a minute. So um, we got this established, so this is our first flow in our multipass TCP connection. The next thing that happens at some point in time, doesn't need to be exactly after the first uh, three handshake, but maybe some, some at some point later in the conversation, the client will send another gin, a SYN packet with uh, an option called MP join, multipass join. And again, it sends its token. Same thing from the other side, server sends a synarch, MP join, all fine, this is my token, and an egg again, same options, and there we go. We have subflow one and a second subflow, so we have a perfectly working multipass TCP connection at this point in time. As easy as that. Well, the problem is, and I mean, uh, multipass, the first uh, ideas or the first implementations have been back in 2007 or 2008, I believe. Uh, and since then, uh, as you could have seen from, the, from my question before, just one, you know, basically in this audience played around with it, there has not really been a really, you know, big uh, deployment of multipass TCP. We didn't, or we don't really see it in the wild uh, as much as we would expect from a protocol being that old. Uh, what is the reason for that? Well, uh, if you invent or develop a new protocol, you have to make sure, and that was one of the goals, that it works on today's network. Um, so this is an uh, IP and TCP header, basically. On the top you see the IP header followed by the TCP, the regular TCP header. So my question to you is, if you send uh, a packet of this sort through your network, uh, just you know, from one host to the other, in, this, in the next reachable subnet, so it needs to be routed once, what do you think are the fields that are going to be changed throughout the network when it, 
you know, has to be sent throughout the network, which fields need to be changed when you route a packet at first. TTL, TTL correct. And as well, you know, if you change the TTL, you have to recalculate the checksum, so header checksum will change. Okay, that's fine, we can deal with that. Uh, so what about, you know, you leave your home network and you send it to somewhere else on the internet, what's going to happen? NAT, Net. network address translation. So we are going to change the source IP of the IP address of our home internet router, most likely. And if packets come back in, we do the same thing with the destination IP address, right? What else changes? Source port, and if the packet comes back in, destination port. Okay, so basically that all changes. Uh, but that's fine, I mean, we're talking about multipath TCP, so we don't really care about IP too much. So what about the TCP header? Um, will the sequence number we apply to my, you know, to that packet that you send from the client, will it remain throughout the whole network? Or on the path to your server? Or will it change? It depends, yeah, good, good answer. <laughs> On what is the next question? Uh, proxies. proxies, firewalls maybe. Well, there's a, there's a feature on firewalls, a feature um, that is randomizing the sequence number because in very old TCP stack implementations, you could guess what the next sequence number would be and can hijack a, a session. So of course, the sequence number will change and if we change the sequence number, we also have to change the acknowledgement number, and basically everything changes when you route it through a network, so that's it. And because that's not enough, actually the whole IP packet and TCP header will change at some point in time. So this is actually a problem if you really want to you know, invent a new protocol that has to rely on current you know, TCP, uh, sorry, on network systems, firewalls, proxies, whatever you have out there, you name it, uh, and make it all the way through and still work. So yeah, so that was the problem. Why is that a problem? Let's look at it, and uh, I, I mentioned that there's a, the option for MP capable three times in the, in the handshake, and the reason for that is our nasty middle box, be it a firewall, be it a proxy, be it whatever, you know. And this uh, bad-looking black box here is, a, is a, our middle box in this case. So, same thing again. We're standing this in, MP capable option set. Our middle box doesn't understand what this is, just drops it and the SYN reaches the server without the option. Well, that, that's fine, because then the server says, okay, this, there's, no, there's no client capable of speaking multipass, so I'm not going to send my option in the SYN arc, even if I'm able to speak MP, uh, multipass TCP. So since the SYN back, uh, both clients, uh, both client and server has uh, the uh, multipass status disabled. That's all fine. So the next case would be, we're gonna strip the uh, MP capable option from the SYNAC because you never know which way you're making it back. So there can be different paths in the network that you take for the SYNAC compared to the SYN. So that's the total reasonable, reasonable option here in this case. So server th still thinks, okay, the client is capable of speaking uh, multipass TCP, so it's enabled on this side. Uh, client receives the uh, SYNAC without the MP capable option disabled on this side. It will not send the option a third time in the ACK. So that is the reason why we have it three times in there. And the third case, well, yeah, that's probably the worst case you can have. The MP capable option will be stripped from the egg, from the final egg from the client. So that means the client now thinks, okay, we can, we can speak multi-path TCP. The server still, no, not going to happen, right? So there's, there's solutions to that as well, but I would just like to point out and, and explain you why the very, very basic operations of multipass TCP can be very tricky in, in a today's network where not all boxes understand what's going on there. Yeah, so we actually minimize the risk with that. Um, and just as a little spoiler, the multipass TCP is always able to change back to regular TCP, even in a working uh, connection already. So whenever something strange happens in the conversation, it will always have the option to fall back. There's a mechanism to do that. But in that case, it will never go back to multipass again with that particular server. So once that happens, you're back on regular TCP. All right, so if the demo got approved uh, and the Wi-Fi is stable enough, I will be able to show you uh, how this works actually in production. So let me jump on my little uh, lab at home.
case the connection is still there. Looks good. So what I'm having here is um, I've built me a little lab in, in, uh, on my uh, home ESXi server, basically consisting of a very, very, very easy network. So, oh, you don't see anything. That's good. <laughs> uh, wait a sec. Let me stop the presentation. All right, here we go. So this is my, my little setup. Uh, it's basically a virtualized, um, two virtualized, uh, or three virtualized routers that are running on my ESXi server at home. Um, it does have a connection to my actual physical home network. And then on the other side here, I have two uh, LANs, one in the 10, 20, 30, and the other one in the 172, 16 range, so you can clearly, clearly spot a difference in the IP addresses later on when we jump on the box. So I have a client down here, basically, connected to both networks. So there's a Debian VM running on the same host. Uh, it has two virtual uh, NICs, and those are connected to both networks. And uh, then on the way, you know, when it makes it, when the traffic makes it through all this stuff, it will route it through my uh, home uh, internet access. Um, let's zoom out here once. So what I've got here is, I um, may need to increase this a little bit for you in the back, uh, a Debian VM. And the one thing that's special about it is that I'm actually using a kernel that is capable of multipass TCP. So, if you want to play around with multipass TCP, the, the very, very basic or the most easy option would be to go on a page called multipass-tcp.org. Um, those are the, the guys maintaining this site are basically behind the IETF draft for multipass TCP. And uh, they came up with a uh, pre-compiled multipass uh, Linux kernel. So you can just, you know, add your APT repository to your Debian VM or um, even on a workstation, whatever. Uh, install it, reboot the machine, and then your kernel is uh, capable of multipass. Um, so the, the another thing you need to take or make sure is obviously that if you really want to play around with different passes, you need to have two, at least two uh, network interface cards. So in my case, as you can see here, ENS192 and ENS224, uh, and those are connected to the previously seen uh, networks behind the virtualized routers here. So, okay, so we've got two networks. Uh, let's see if we have a connection to both uh, routers. That is the case. So the dot one is my default gateway in both uh, networks. And the one thing I can show you here is what's still special about it and what you need to do um, after you reboot your client uh, if you don't have, have to make it persistent. Uh, you need to, let's see, IP root show. You need to have basically a default route to any of the interfaces of your choice. Doesn't matter. Uh, it's just you know the, the fallback route. What the client should use in case uh, it needs to talk to the internet and uh, one or the other uh, interface is not available. So this is uh, just you know a default route that might be in there from the beginning. And then in addition to that, you need to apply uh, or need to create two different routing tables. The first routing table taking the traffic from my uh, 10, 20, 30 slash 24 network uh, with the source of my interface that is in that network. And the second table doing the same thing for the other network. So what this will look like is if you, you can do IP uh, route show table one. Okay, and the only thing I have in there is basically another default route and saying, okay, uh, this is my slash 24 network on this interface. And I have the same thing on table number two for the other network. And uh, then there's a rule, or actually two rules, that say if you're coming from this IP address, so my first interface, then please look up your routes in table number two. And if you're coming from this IP address, then please look up your routes in table number one. So it's just basically load balancing uh, from, from the routing point of view, just load balancing across both interfaces. That's all it does. Um, so, uh, okay, so we got the installed, we got the kernel, we got the interfaces, IP addresses applied, routing applied. So the next thing we want to do is to connect to a server that is actually capable of multipass. <laughs> There's not many out there, but luckily the guys from uh, multipass-ttp.org uh, they made their web server multipass capable. 
So while you're sitting here, you could actually try to uh, follow along and try it, but uh, you, uh, you might not have the, the proper kernel version installed yet. So what I can do, for instance, is just do a, an easy curl on a file from them. Uh, I need to zoom out a little bit here. Hope that's still readable. So what I'm doing is I'm downloading a file from, from their web server. Uh, it's like a big, I don't know, image file, whatever, and just pipe into def null, so I don't want to actually receive the file, but I want to have an ongoing uh, TCP file transfer. Uh, you can spot immediately that the download range is, uh, download ra yeah, rate is pretty low. <laughs> Um, the reason for that being my little host at home that is currently virtualizing three routers, a VM, uh, and a firewall, and stuff like that. So don't really look at the performance at this point in time, but the actual th thing I wanted to show you is, uh, and I'm still on the same, on the same VM, just another uh, CLI window here. Uh, if you issue a netstart-m, I also add a numeric option, it will actually show you your open MP TCP connections, and it also gives you a little bit more information like uh, what is the local token, what is the remote token, so those are the two options that have been exchanged in the, uh, in the three-year handshake and stuff like that. But, um, I mean, currently we are seeing one connection, so that is not very helpful in terms of multipath TCP, uh, and is that actually the truth? Well, it turns out that with this option in Netstat, you will actually just only see the connections that are marked as multipass TCP connections. So um, let's double check that with a regular, you know, Netstat dash an. Want to see everything in numeric, and I might want to grab on all my established connections. And since I know this is a web download, I'm also grabbing on port 80. Uh, okay. So what do we see now? This is my multipass tcp org server. So all those IP address match. Uh, and I see three connections, actually. But if you look closely, uh, you will notice that this connection and this connection is actually the same. So uh, Netstat tricks you a little bit here because uh, it recognizes, based on the kernel, that you, you have a multipass tcp connection. Uh, we'll mark this as multipass tcp but these two are the actual underlying TCP flows. So multipass TCP works in, works in a way that it adds onto the TCP header for sure, but from the application point of view, you have like a multipass TCP layer, and below that you have a layer of subflows. So it can be one up to, I don't know, infinite number of subflows. And um, that's ex exactly what you're seeing here. Netstat is telling us, okay, we have one connection, that's what the application would see, but below that, under the hood, you actually have two connections, uh, TCP connections to uh, your server. Right, so, and the good thing about this is, and let's check if the download is still running. I hope so. Yes, it does, because it's very slow. Uh, what I can do is, let me zoom out quickly. I can do a, um, let's say EF config, and uh, just need to be sure I don't cut myself off here at this point in time. I think this one is the one I'm not using. So I'll bring down the first interface. Maybe that was the connection I was using. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so let's do one thing. Use the other one to connect to it. Uh, 10, 20, 30, 21, I hope. Or the other one. Yeah, not this one, obviously. Let's use the other address. And if I'm lucky enough, I might still have a connection. Yes. No. <laughs> uh, we're getting there, we're getting there. If I can remind my password. There we go. Okay, so if config, yeah, so this connection is still up and running. Uh, sadly enough, no, since this connection here died, I cannot really show you, oh, I can actually, can I show you if the connection is still up and running if I just go for a uh, net start dash an, grab nicely established. Yes, it's still there. So uh, let me zoom in for you. 
even though my SSH session to, to my curl uh, download died, but you can see uh, it's still using the other address to, to download the file. So that means, well, the, the actual use case for this is you can, uh, you can disconnect subflows as many as you want. As long as there is still one subflow being active, your connection will not die. So be, be it voice, be it a download, be it whatever, you will not notice any you know, interruption in your connection as long as still one subflow is up and active. Um, the default is that it opens, um, we will see that in a trace in a minute, uh, that it opens up the connections and all the available links. There are different, um, I won't call them scheduler, but there are different options in multipass TCP uh, that you can actually adjust in Linux, saying, I want to use all my connections N to N. So let's say you have two client and two server connections, then it will build four subflows in total, like crisscross them, or you just want to have one connection from every interface, that's also a possibility. Uh, and the default, I think it's uh, doing one-on-one -on -one instead of end-to-end. -end. Can you make a policy that some connections will be record TCP and some will be multiple? Um, you can actually tell, when you call the socket from your application, you can tell it to use multipass TCP and how many subflows. I think that's possible. Uh, just only if the application is not aware of it, uh, it will do whatever the default is for that Linux implementation. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, the question is for, for the recording. Uh, whether or not you can influence how many connections the application is going to use. And the answer is yes, you can do that um, if you're a smart enough programmer, probably. Um, okay, yeah, so this was a little, you know, demo uh, to show you that it's actually working. And um, I will show you later what you might can or might be able to use at home to play around with it a little bit more. Uh, but for now, just I will come back to the slides. Any, any more questions on how this stuff worked so far? Yes, please. On the, uh, so assuming that there's no mailbox, that yeah. you will have multiply and hand server support, is there anything that would, are there any other barriers to supporting for MPTCP? Uh, any other barriers for MPTCP except from, from nasty middle boxes? Yes, exactly. And that's also, if you think about it, that could be a security concern. Because you can now transfer your malware across 200 subflows, and your firewall will probably not be able to merge them together if it's not aware of multipass TCP. Yeah. How are the sequence numbers handled in this? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that was actually a good, a good question in the right direction. Um, so how are we actually going to send data across our subflows? So with regular TCP, and we have seen this so many times, just a really quick repetition, this is the amount of data that we are getting from our application down the stack. TCP will put it on the wire uh, in this order, maybe another order, and on the other side, the server will receive it, cache it in the receive window if everything has been acknowledged pump it up to the application, we're good to go. So acknowledge is coming back, yeah, as easy as that. So with multipass TCP, uh, the very first initiative for the first thoughts were maybe we just you know, split the cross ticket across all the links that we have or across all the passes that we have. Meaning if we have four packets or chunks, whatever, of data, we're gonna send one and three on the first subflow and we're gonna send two and four on the second subflow. Yeah, that could work. Well, what about the middle boxes? <laughs> because it's multipass TCP, and the name applies it, there, there can be a different path for your second connection, for your second subflow. Um, so let's imagine there's a middle box of some sort in the second subflow, and you have transferred just only data two and four on the second subflow. What will the the middle box actually see when the acknowledgements are coming back. I mean, the server received the, the, the data and sends the acknowledgements from the second subflow back on the same link. So that means, and I can go back one slide again, we have sent two and four, so the acknowledgements that we are expecting on that link will be the acknowledgements for data two and four. So from the middle box perspective, 
um, as soon as the acknowledgement number two comes in, what does that mean? What does that mean in regular TCP when you're acknowledging from zero to two in one packet? Correct, so that means it assumes that packet number one and two uh, are acknowledged with this single acknowledge. So it cum cumulatively acknowledges data one and two. Uh, but that can't be true because this box never has seen packet number one. So what's going to happen here? Um, basically three options. Uh, it would either drop the acknowledgement so two and four will just not be transmitted at all. It will correct the acknowledgement. I will show you how that looks like in a, in a second here. Or just reset the connection. So the whole subflow will, will go nuts and, uh, and we are back on one subflow here in this case. So in the second option, when it's actually correcting the acknowledgement, this will happen. Instead of sending acknowledgement number two, it will send acknowledgement number zero. Why? Because the only, <laughs> the only data it has seen so far, uh, I don't want to go back on the slides, but have been, I have sent one and three here, and two and four here. So the only data it has seen, and I think I can add another one, uh, is zero, basically, because there was a gap in between. I cannot send from zero to two uh, and expecting the, the middle box to just you know, acknowledge two, even though it has never been seen. So it will only acknowledge zero, and on the, on the upper path, it will acknowledge the, uh, the, the first data, obviously, but not the third. So never been seen, uh, not going to happen. So that means, from the client's perspective, I'm now getting back an acknowledgement on data zero and one, and that doesn't make any sense to me at all. So this will actually break the multipass TCP session right there. And the only option for, for the client here in this case is to fall back on regular TCP. So what have we learned about this? Um, if we are going to use sequence numbers from our pool of sequence numbers across different subflows, we are going to have a problem. Uh, we cannot do this because the boxes that only understand regular TCP will go nuts, right? So we have to make sure that for our, I don't know how many subflows we have, we use a dedicated sequence number pool for that. So, and that's what I, what I was saying here, but the, the uh, caveat of that is if we're using sequence numbers for each dedicated session, how are we actually going to take track about data that we send across multiple subflows? So we need to make sure that we get the acknowledges back from our data that we have sent. And we want to have them on the path that we sent them and not on the other path because uh, that's the only chance how we can detect packet loss on, on that path. So what we need is actually an additional option for that. So here's the uh, regular TCP header again. Uh, the first part, the source port, destination port, sequence number acknowledgement will stay mainly untouched, so that will look like perfectly regular TCP. But what we are going to do is we insert options in the TCP options field, being the data sequence number and also being the data acknowledgement number. And these are actually dedicated to each subflow, uh, sorry, to, to the amount of data we send. So if we are going to send 100 bytes of data, uh, we are going to share this data sequence number across all of our subflows. So um, that multipass TCP stack is still capable of tracking if all the data that I've sent across my flows actually reached uh, the, the receiver. So here's how, how this is going to look like. Uh, I've got three packets to send. Uh, this is my first data that I'm going to send. Uh, I encapsulate this in my TCP. I apply a sequence number from whatever. It's a random sequence number. Send it across the, the link. Uh, since I only send one byte of data, the next sequence number will be 101, obviously. And I'm going to send another uh, chunk of data. Now, on my second slab flow, I can use the exact same sequence number if I want to, because that's not attached in any way to the other subflow. Uh, but I want to make sure that my data sequence number 
uh, is another is is a, is a unique number compared to the uh, other data I've sent across subflow one. Yeah. So this is not actually the amount of data. Sorry, I've been uh, telling that wrong before. This is actually the data sequence number I have in my packets. So what's going to happen if we experience packet loss on subflow number two? Um, the default right now in the implementation, as you can as you can try it on your uh, Linux uh, system. Uh, says that if I experience packet, uh, packet loss on subflow number two, and there's a timeout on that, multipass TCP is going to resend the data on subflow number one, applying the same data sequence number, but a different you know, TCP sequence number, because we need to fit it somehow in this already established TCP connection. Um, so in that case, you can you know, circumvent uh, short time frames where you just have bad signal uh, or bad, bad reception on your cell phone whatsoever. Um, you just resend it on the other flow, and as soon as you notice that, okay, the second flow is, the second subflow is uh, operating properly again, and it TCP, multipass TCP does constantly monitor this, uh, it will uh, start using it again. So uh, I've got a trace in the uh, zip file that you have downloaded, maybe. Uh, that I wanted to show you and how this actually looks like in Wireshark because lucky enough the uh, this sector is already there So we can use Wireshark to look into uh, multipass TCP So uh, let me go so the uh, trace again is called uh, NPTCP cli underscore client zero one pcap if you want to open that with me And I will do this here How, many, how much time do we have left? 2.45, right? 20 minutes, that's good. So what do we have? And let me increase the font for you again. Is that okay for the back? Great. Uh, so let's quickly jump into the conversations, see what we have. Okay, there's, uh, there's two TCP connections in this trace. I wonder why, <laughs> multipass TCP. So, um, all right, that's good enough, uh, but let's look at the first uh, three year handshake here. So, uh, my, my client is the 10001 and the service is 10101. And we will see if we open up the uh, TCP header and the options section that there is a new option and it's carrying some sort of data. First of all, multipass capable. So that is the, the basic option that we need to have. Uh, we also see that there's some sort of keys in there, and those are the uh, tokens that I referred to earlier. Why are they in there? I'm going to show you in a second. So let's look at the Synac. We're expecting also the server to send back an MP capable option. That's perfectly fine. Uh, it's also including a key of some sort, and then in the in the lower section here, you see something that is called expected IDSN. And this number is the initial data sequence number that those guys are going to use to, to you know, tell each other how much data they send across uh, the different subflows. And in the ECK, finally, we again see the multipass capable option and uh, some other stuff here that we don't really take care about here right, at this point in time. So what's the next thing that's going to happen that is uh, rather unusual compared to normal TCP at this point in time? Like exactly the next packet you look at. So we have a three-year handshake. The, the client has opened the session, obviously. The client has opened the session. And then it sends another but rather empty TCP packet to the other side. Can you see that in your trace as well? So what is, what is he doing there? Can everybody spot something new? And it's in the options, just a little hint. Second flow, uh, so telling the server what's going to happen next probably. Yeah, that's a good guess. So what it's, what it's doing here right now, it's adding a, a option called add address. Well, that's actually a command within these options. And if we open that up, we see a rather new IP address. 
So we don't see we don't see the 10, 0, 1, 1 in our trace because we're just seeing 10, 0, 0, 1 and 10, 1, 0, 1. But there's no 10, 0, 1, 1 yet in the trace. So that's a, good, that's a good information. Maybe this is the second IP address of the client that uh, he's going to use for his multipass. All right. So uh, next thing that happens, okay, is, I mean, just a regular data transfer. The only difference being is that we are not, you know, looking at sequence numbers only. We also have to take care about um, the data sequence numbers, which are in here. And uh, luckily enough, Wireshark Dissector also allows us to use relative sequence numbers for these encapsulated data sequence numbers. So similar to the uh, TCP sequence numbers, you can uh, you know, make it easier for your eyes to spot uh, um, the, the numbers or any uh, irregulations between them. Uh, okay, let's go down a little bit. Let's go down a little bit. Uh, and at some point, hmm, okay, we see a little bit of out of order, dupe X, whatsoever. And there is another sin. And what's the address? 10101. Does that correlate to the address we have seen in the add address option here before? Let's check it again. Oh, where are we? Add address. Advertise IP address 10.0.1.1. So we go down to the sin again. Uh, there you go. 10.1.0.1. Okay, that's interesting. So let's open up this uh, MPTCP header and see if there's any difference between the ones we have seen at the very beginning of the trace. And there's the join connection option that we have seen before. So this is actually an indication that, okay, if, if you only see this sort of connection set up, there, that this is a subflow of an existing MPTCP connection. So by the nature of TCP, a multipath TCP, you might not be able to capture all of the related subflows in your network if you capture at some point. Uh, but if you see a joint connection, that is an indication for, okay, there is somewhere in the network another connection from this client to the particular server. And this is just an added subflow to it. Right. So um, same thing here, uh, ex except that the MP capable option is replaced by join. Uh, the uh, sender's token or key is sent again, and this is an indication for the server that this is actually the same client he's talking to. Because otherwise, you know, imagine the server will be sitting there receiving a SYN from an unknown IP address, basically, um, and doesn't know what to do with it. Uh, the at address option in combination with the token is an indication for the server that this is actually the same client. And there is a cryptographic mechanism behind generating those tokens, so uh, you cannot easily just spoof them and uh, send a, a join connection with the uh, at address uh, announced IP address earlier. So okay, we have SYNS and ACK, and that's it. Uh, we have two connections at this point of time. So when you look at, um, at the TCP stream graph, Uh, stream ID zero, switch direction. Okay, here's our data transfer. Looks rather usual. I mean, there's lots of window left, so it's not really efficiently using what, what you can use, but looks like a perfectly normal TCP data transfer. If we now jump onto the second stream, which since we only have two streams in here, it must be the other, the other uh, multipass TCP subflow. We don't see anything, and if we switch direction, there's, well, one packet one packet and the whole data transfer. So if I jump to that packet, and a good thing to have, in particular if you're debugging uh, multipass TCP, uh, is you want to make sure that in your columns you add the uh, stream ID. Uh, so again, control shift I. Uh, at the very end probably, yes. So this is very useful uh, when you troubleshoot multipass TCP because you can immediately spot, because the IP addresses might look very similar, but you can immediately spot, okay, uh, if I scroll down the trace at some point, there might be a stream ID one, hopefully. Did I over overlook it already? Uh, let's see, once more. 
Oh, I've sorted by it. Yeah, okay, that's why. Sorry. So there was there was a one somewhere. Yeah, here you go. Okay. So this is another stream, obviously. So this is my second subflow, and we see exactly one packet being transferred over the second subflow. Wow, that, that's very cool, right? Like we're having two connections, and we are sending one packet on the second connection. Um, well, the thing is that even though multipass TCP works with applications that are not aware of it, it doesn't make it very efficient. So if your application actually tells your TCP stack, I want to use just one flow, uh, it can do that. And it will only send a packet on the second flow in case there is packet loss or congestion on the first subflow. Right, so in this particular case, there might have been a packet loss at some point or the uh, multipass TCP uh, stack recognizes some congestion uh, appearing. Then it will jump on the second flow and use that uh, you know, other pipe to send through the data or maybe just resend a retransmission that, that, we, uh, that got lost on the first subflow. So you're, you're talking about the failover mode. Is it not possible to use round robin that you send here once Yes, you can do that. And there's uh, actually different, um, different schedulers available in Multipass TCP how you can influence this. Um, there's, a whole, there's a whole paper about what sort of congestion control algorithm we want to use on Multipass TCP because they are somehow coupled, right? So. Um, and um, that, that, that would go into too much detail as of now, but um, there's, there's different ways of behavior, and that's also why I put in two different traces in your, in your uh, zip file, because this is one of the traces where you see that um, the second subflow has only been used when it really needs it in case of packet loss, for example. In the other trace that you have in there, uh, it's called MPTCP Debian, I believe, that is actually a capture of my lab at home, um, and you will see it using both both connections at the same time, uh, pretty much 50-50. Okay, so anything else I wanted to cover in here? Let me quickly take a look at my notes. Um, okay. So uh, one thing I want to point out, though, is uh, if, you're, if you're looking for um, Wireshark filters on MPTCP, the first thing that comes into your mind is use the MPTCP dissector filter, whatever, uh, which works. But the options that are behind this are very limited, as you can see. So you don't, you don't really have um, much opportunities to filter on anything. Instead, what you want to do is use tcp.options. M, well, sorry, TCP options dot MPTCP, and there you see that there are a lot more options available. So one advice, if you're getting an MPTCP trace, you're not really sure about what's going on in there and how many connections and how many flows you have, um, you can rely on these subtypes filters to, uh, to check on what you're going to see in there. And I will quickly show you an overview. Um, of what, what sort of types we have. So these are the options you will find in there, and we have seen MP capable and we have M seen MP join. The DSS is the data sequence signal. We have already seen that in the trace, and the add address option as well. And then there's also an option for the remove address. The other ones are not really used that much. That's why I highlighted uh, just the first uh, one, two, three, six, five, six here as, uh, as being the most important. So if you open up a trace and you know there's MPTCP in there and you want to know how many subflows or how many addresses does a client actually have and it's not using yet properly, what you can do is uh, search for this particular option at address, for example. So in our case, when we go back to the uh, uh, trace here, what I can do is uh, tcpoptions.mptcp.subtype uh, equals equals three, for example. And that will exactly show me this uh, very first dupe act that we saw after the initial three-way handshake where the, uh, the add address option is present in, right? So, and this client obviously just has another, just one other IP address that it can use, but you, you could actually see more if, if the client would have been able to use more in here. So that gives you a hint on what IP address to look for if you, you know, follow the trace and, and troubleshoot. 
Okay, um, the other trace in there again is uh, slightly different looking, like 50-50 traffic uh, distribution. You might want to look into that. I'm not going to do this in respect to the time right now, uh, but it might be interesting for you as well. That's why I kept it in there. So, um, back to the slides real quick. We have like nine, eight minutes left. Um, so these are the options, talked about that already. Um, and here again is, is, a, is another theory so that um, shows you how MPTCP is currently reacting, uh, but it's also de dependent on the actual implementation that you use. So for instance, uh, in this particular case, uh, in our subflow one, we have a rather low RTT, so round-trip time, but we have moderate to high loss. And on the subflow number two, we have a higher round-trip time, but low loss. So this could be a typical behavior like your cell phone being on Wi-Fi with higher loss, but your 4G or 3G, uh, 3G signal uh, has a higher round-trip time, but very low loss. So in that particular case, if you follow the very, very basic and first strict MPTCP rules, all of the traffic would be put on this link because this is the least congested link. Uh, doesn't make you happy when you receive the final, you know, receipt of your of your data plan, probably end of the month. Um, but uh, yeah, this is how TCP or multipass TCP was designed in the very beginning. What they are saying now is, please use the least congested path with the lowest RTT possible. Uh, and the other thing is that MPTCP throughput should always be. Uh, or should not be less than the, uh, than the best possible TCP throughput you could get from a network. So if you have 100 megabits here and 20 megabits here, and MPTCP would only use this link, obviously that would be a bad decision. So in that particular case, most of the traffic you will be seeing on, on this uh, link here, and only uh, in case of uh, a loss, it will change on the other link. So some use cases. Uh, I mean, this is all very interesting. So how, how are people actually going to use this? And I have referenced this particular case with your mobile phone uh, very often. Uh, in the data centers, imagine like how many more links you could actually utilize. Uh, and it doesn't really matter on what sort of load balancing mechanisms you have um, to remove those bottlenecks. So who is using it today? Well, we do have the Linux kernel implementation that I've been using in my lab. Um, Apple is actually using it for quite a while now. So I think they started using it in 2010 or 11 uh, with Siri. So whenever you talk to Siri, you will see uh, a multipath TCP connection being opened on Wi-Fi and 4G. Um, there's a trace of that also in your captures, uh, but you can easily do that uh, at home. Um, just, you know, capture on your router, firewall, whatever you have, and you will see at least the Wi-Fi multipath um, part of it. Cedric is using it, FreeBSD is uh, also implemented of some sort, and uh, you see it on Oracle and Solaris as well. Um, so what can you do with it at home? Again, you can just install it. You don't really need to change your applications. They will be fine, even though uh, your server might not support MP, uh, multipass TCP. Uh, another cool thing is this little project here called Open MPTCP Router. So what this basically is, is a variant of, uh, I believe, Open WRT or DDWRT. Um, and this guy has built a box that, uh, well, it basically replaces your home router. And as long as you have two connections, like in my particular case, I have a very, very uh, low bandwidth uh, DSL connection at home, I would like to add another one. What I can do is, if there's no other chance, use a 4G modem or uh, maybe a second DSL line. And you can run a multipath TCP connection as some sort of proxy uh, from your router to any, let's say, VM you have somewhere in a data center. So just buy a cheap VPS somewhere, uh, install the multipath kernel, use this MPTCP router to use, utilize both DSL links, and there you go, you have probably doubled your bandwidth at home. Um, I haven't really played around with it too much. Uh, what you want to make sure is that you don't have huge differences in route trip times of your two DSL lines, because that actually, um, from that, MPTCP could actually quite suffer. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a nice thing, a nice little project. The UI is looking very fancy, all the kind of stuff, so you might want to give it a try. Uh, Okay, so uh, a list of references that I've used for my research uh, and my playing around. Um, 
Uh, also, this link is quite interesting. Uh, that was presented on uh, one of the security conferences like years ago, where they actually uh, wrote a little scapy module for MPTCP that you could use to see how your fire will do with uh, malware traffic being spread across subflows. So that's quite interesting. Um, and then again, the recent uh, IETF draft on on the on the last changes in, in MPTCP. Yeah, uh, I think that that being it, um, with everything I've prepared so far, I'm open for questions either now or later. And uh, thank you very much for coming. More questions? Yeah. Um, I just look at your spaces. Mm -hmm. Not too sure on that, to be honest. Uh, I haven't really checked on that because the the one thing I captured personally was uh, HTTP and HTTPS. So in the um, in the Debian trace, that is plain HTTP. If you don't see anything in there, then that might be a case. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the reassembly doesn't work in that. That's a good question. Never tried that. Yeah. Any more questions? If not, feel free to come over in the front uh, as long as we don't disturb the next talk. Um, I'm happy to stay here. All right.